Hello, everybody. Welcome to the session. Full house today. We have almost a thousand people registered for this one, so it's going to be fun. Um, I know some of you have never used Storyline before, so hopefully this will be a good intro. And I know some of you have probably joined my other Storyline workshops and maybe got a little overwhelmed or frustrated because we get pretty advanced pretty quickly in those. So this one is designed exclusively for beginners. Um, we'll still probably keep the pace up a bit. And I, I'm seeing in the chat some people can't hear me. Please let me know if you're having any trouble with that or maybe just try refreshing. But um, yeah, so we're still gonna keep a pretty decent pace, um, but I'm gonna try to keep the concepts pretty beginner focused. And we're probably not going to be able to cover everything in an hour, but we are going to get through as much as we can. Since we have some new people here, very quickly, you may be wondering like why you would want to learn Storyline or like if it's worth it or if you should pursue a different tool. So I just want to show you a little bit of data that's been coming in this year from these surveys uh, we've been conducting. So this one right here is the hiring manager survey. So 101 hiring managers filled this out, most of them in the corporate space. And when they were asked what the top three tools and technologies were, literally 87 out of these 101 hiring managers listed Storyline as one of those top three tools. <laughs> so when I saw this, I was like, wow. Um, my hunch was correct because because when I was doing client work, like 95% of the projects that people came to me for were storyline projects, but the data kind of backs that up here. And then we recently did this instructional designer survey and we asked instructional designers what tool they use most often out of all of the other tools on the job, 40% of them. And this is like 600 something instructional designers, 40% of them use storyline and 17% use rise. So Again, just goes to show how prevalent Storyline is in our field right now. People can debate, you know, is it the best tool? Should we be moving past it? But we can't deny the fact that it's like really saturated in our field right now. So obviously, pretty good, good tool to know. And then the last thing I found that is just like also helpful when you're when you're considering tools like this, Articulate just raised $1.5 billion. <laughs> so like I didn't know they were such a huge company. And then when I was reading this article, I saw um what is it? Like every single Fortune 100 company uses the Articulate Suite. So I don't know if you needed any more convincing, but as you can see, Storyline is kind of leading the charts here in our industry at the moment. And this can change quickly. I know Captivate is working on a big update, but um, we'll see how that goes. So this is like a little project I threw together yesterday because I was trying to think of something where we could dive into variables and, or not variables, where we could dive into like states and layers and triggers would be pretty simple. Don't ask me about the theme, you'll see. So if we answer wrong, we, we just try again. If we answer correctly, we have this key that we can drag to like unlock this treasure chest. <laughs> so I had some fun with it and I'll leave it up to you. Like, do we want, do you want to go through this and we'll build out this quick project together? I'll give you all of the assets we need, or would you rather we just kind of freestyle it, um, like feature by feature? All right. I'm seeing some yeses. Yeah. It's not exactly the most corporate -y project, but, and I, and I, we could have had some more fun with the branding, but I was trying to keep in mind that like, I don't want you all to have to download fonts and stuff. So, okay, cool. Looks like we are on board with building this project. So, and I'll, and I'll try to break down the features as we get to each one and just kind of talk about what else is possible with them. So we'll try to do a little bit of both. And, and of course we are somewhat limited on time, but we'll do our best. So I'm going to share all of the files we need in the sidebar right now. Um, so you should be seeing like some pop-ups on your screen or some options to download these. Yeah, there's the handouts folder on the right. If you're watching this replay on YouTube, because the replay will be available, I'm all, I'll share like a Google Drive link in the description and you can, you can download all of these there. And that being said, well, let me, let me finish sharing these for download and then I'll, I'll say something else. Okay, there are five total files. They should all be, they should all be up for you now. So if you are, you know, if you have Storyline open and you're pretty quick with it, you'll be able to follow along here. 
But what I may recommend is maybe as we go through it this time, maybe hang out and watch and like for the slower parts, like try to, you know, do a little bit, but it might be good to soak up what we're doing here and then catch the replay on YouTube tomorrow and then actually try to follow along and build it step by step. Because like I said, the, the pace may be fairly quick, even though we'll be covering beginner concepts. So you'll have that option. The replay will be available. Okay. So open up storyline if you're going to try to follow along and I think we should dive into this. Okay, here we go. So this right here is storyline 360. And let me um, actually get the chat up in another window just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Cool. Okay, so here we are in storyline. So whenever you open Storyline, you obviously have the option to start from your recent projects. You can start recording your screen. You can import existing projects or PowerPoints. But what you'll probably be doing most of the time is selecting this new project option. And that's what we're going to do here. Dive in and get started on this. OK, so if you are familiar with PowerPoint, you'll probably feel a little at home or at least this will look somewhat familiar. We have, we have some extra things, right? We have like a triggers over here. That's not in PowerPoint, all these properties. Some things are different, but generally this toolbar at the top will look quite familiar. Like this is like exactly out of PowerPoint, <laughs> right? But before we get started on anything, there are two things I usually recommend that we do whenever we create a new project. The first one is to save it, right? Storyline. You know, we just talked about how popular it is. That doesn't mean that it's a flawless tool. It crashes a lot. Things will break. We want to make sure that we're saving as, as frequently as we remember to. Like I hear about people losing work too many times. So we'll go to file and then save as. Just like any other program where you would save something. So pretty, pretty straightforward there. So we'll go to file, save as. And this is where we will name our project. We'll name it um, pirate. Pirate, sure. Just name it whatever you like. Intro to storyline. Name it whatever you want. <laughs> and then and then you see it's a dot story file. So that is the file extension. Uh, just like dot docx is like a word file. Um, these are dot story files. You can only open them with storyline. And when you open them, you're you're opening them with Storyline, right? You're in like the editor. These aren't files you can share with people to view in their browser. You need to actually publish the project for that to happen. Okay, and all of these assets we got from freepick.com for those who are curious about that. And, and the session is an hour, Ivy. So 50 minutes left. All right, so we have this saved. The second thing, and this one might be a you know, not as familiar for some people, is we want to make sure that the aspect ratio is our project. The aspect ratio of our project is, is where we want it to be. So Storyline is a slide-based authoring tool. And the way I got into that, like this is, this is a story view. We can see all of the slides in our project. When we double click on one of them, we can actually open up that specific slide. Okay, so slide-based authoring tool. And what that means is like, when, if I view this on a phone or on a laptop or on a desktop, this slide will always be the same dimensions. Okay, now maybe it will scale up to fill a bigger screen or maybe it will scale down. But if I'm using this aspect ratio, I'm never going to be able to look at it on my phone in portrait mode and it's gonna just fill up from top to bottom. I'd have to turn it like this so it matches this aspect ratio here. Now you can, you can change this aspect ratio at any time. But as you can imagine, if I have like a widescreen thing and then I change the aspect ratio to be tall and vertical, it's not going to like automatically adjust it to how I want it to be. There's just gonna be a lot of stuff hanging off the screen or it's gonna scale down and be really small in the center with a lot of space on the top and bottom, okay? Um, so how we do that is we go to the design tab. I mean, and I guess this is why I suggest setting your aspect ratio in the very beginning before adding any content to the slides because then you know it's not gonna get messed up later. So we'll go to the design tab and then we will select this slide size option. Okay. Yeah, and I see uh, some conversation about LinkedIn links. Let's hold off on that. Let's not, let's try to keep the chat focused on, um, on, on questions and make sure everyone's able to follow along who's trying to. 
So we go to the design tab and then slide size and yours will probably be this by default. It will be this four, three aspect ratio. So, so this is 720 pixels wide by 540 pixels tall. So we wanna change this. What I usually recommend we use is a nice wide screen option. I recommend that we do 1280 um, by 720. Okay. Now, if we try to just change 1280, we have the aspect ratio locked. So it's not gonna let us like change this how we want it. It's gonna keep changing the other one to maintain that four three aspect ratio. So we can just uncheck that box and then let's do a 1280 pixel width by a 720 pixel height. And this is really cool because uh, in a recent update, like literally just a month ago or so, we can now set this as our default size. So that's why when I created a new project, mine was already on this. And as and like as you know, there may be times in the future when you want to use different aspect ratios, but this is just a really good default. It looks good on mobile devices when you turn it in, into landscape mode. Um, it's not super big. Like you could do 1920 by 1080 if you wanted like something really HD and to use bigger assets. But this has been fine for all of my purposes. So once that is set. Let's go ahead and set it as the default if you'd like, and then press OK. All right, and people are asking about getting Storyline. Yeah, there's a 60-day free trial, and I've heard people who can, you can um, reach out to their support, and they'll, they'll even extend your trial in some cases. And, and any assets, any projects you create while using their trial, as long as you publish it before your trial is, is complete, you'll be able to host that on your portfolio. You'll be able to share it with potential employers and clients. So they have a very generous trial. There are no watermarks and you can do per almost everything you can do in the, in the paid version. And there is a student discount too. I think it's like 500 bucks a year or something like that. Good stuff, okay. So those are the two things we wanna do first. Now we can actually start adding things to the screen. Well, we could, right? Like you can see it's a blank slate here. We could add, we could add images, we could add text, uh, but, but let's preview this. Right? We can preview what the experience will be like from within Storyline, just like we can with PowerPoint. And there are a few ways to do that. You see, we can click on this preview button right here, or we can click on one of these icons on this bar right here. Okay, so I'm just going to click on this desktop icon. It will take a minute to load. And now we'll see, we have this blank slide here that we didn't add anything to, but we also have all of this extra stuff around the slide, right? So this is called the player. Okay, so we have the slide. This is like the blank canvas that we add stuff to. And then the player has like this auto-generated menu that we can open and close, maybe some volume controls. We can add resources and you can customize this player a lot more. We're not going to do that in this case. And for custom projects that you're putting on your portfolio, it's usually nice to just have like custom, you know, custom menus and custom buttons just to make it a bit more customized. So if you're wondering how we can affect all the stuff around the slide, we can do that with this player option right here. So we can edit the player properties. We're not going to dive too deep into that, but let's just open that up right now. We want to remove the player and it's quite easy to do that with the modern player. We can just make it kind of disappear. So once we open these player properties on your own time, if you want, like if you're watching the replay, you could pause this and explore all these different options here, but we just want to turn off the players and the player, or sorry, the menus and controls. So just change that from on to off. And then we'll go over to this colors and effects option right next to it. And we can change it from dark to light. And then even the sidebars will just blend in with the background. If we leave it on dark, there will be like some dark bands on the right and left of our screen when we open the project. So there we go. Those are like the three things I do. If I know I'm not going to be using the player, I just get rid of it. And now we will press Control S to save our progress. Okay, so quite a few things to do before we even dive in, but we should be able to make fairly quick progress now. Um, over here on the right, Okay, notice it says player triggers. There's just one more thing I wanna clear up. Actually, we'll, we'll leave that for now. We, we're gonna to wanna to delete these, but let's start adding to the screen so we can see this thing come to life. Now we know we want this nice background image, right? I shared that background file with you. There are a few ways to adjust the background. 
one way is to just right click on the screen and then go to format background and then you can actually just set it as a picture another way to do it though is to just insert a picture to like onto the slide and let's let's do it that way because that will be yeah a similar development pattern you'll use to like insert media so let's go to the insert tab up here at the top and you can see we have quite a few options worthwhile to explore them in your own time we have this content library 360 section, and these are, this is the content library that Storyline provides you. So there are like millions of assets here. I don't usually use them. They're not like the, the best assets ever. The characters, probably seen these before, right? And they have all sorts of different poses and expressions. You don't have full access to this, this library on the trial though. So we're not gonna be too concerned with that. We want to look in this media section. And this is how, you know, if you select a picture in this section, it pulls media from your computer. Whereas if you if you select photos from this section, it's going to try to pull from like a stock library. So let's just select picture here. And then we'll navigate to your downloads folder where you just downloaded all of these project assets. Okay, so we will double click on background or you can just click on it and then select open. And that's how we'll get this file added to the screen. And you can see, right, this works as a background. We can move it around. But because I exported this as the same exact size as the um, slide, which is 1280 by 720, as soon as we insert it, it just fills it up completely. OK, so there we go. That's how we add an asset. Um, you can add videos and audio the same way. Right, so you see video, audio, and then if, if you just add something and don't really do anything else to it, it's going to appear for the duration of the slide. So if we preview this now, as you can imagine, we're literally just going to see that background. Fairly straightforward, if you use PowerPoint, probably exactly the same as adding an image to the slide. So let's add another image here. So we'll go to the Insert tab, we will select Picture, and let's select this closed chest. Okay, this is gonna be the chest that people need to unlock. And uh, Roberta, probably a good idea to like keep your files organized. But since we're doing this kind of fast, if you can pull from your downloads folder, that will work. If you move the files like later from your downloads folder, they're not going to be affected with from within Storyline. So they're embedded when you insert them into a project. They're not linked, if that makes sense. Yeah, good tips. You can hold down Control on your mouse or Control on your keyboard, and then zoom in and out with your mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Um, so you can see different different parts of the project. Uh, but we can see we just inserted this closed chest. We can drag it around. You know, by default, it's just going to be centered. We want this to kind of fit in nicely down here next to this barrel. So you can see I'm holding down control and zooming in here. The alternative, if you don't have a mouse wheel for whatever reason, is all the way down in the bottom right, you'll see this like zoom toggle option, zoom level. So you could use that. And I'm sure there are other shortcuts, maybe control plus and control minus. I'm not sure though if that works in this program. No, it doesn't. Okay, so we want to resize this a little bit. Now, if we, re if we drag from one of the corners, it's going to maintain the aspect ratio. Right? Like if we drag from the top, we obviously don't want it looking like that. <laughs> so when we are resizing things, we do want to drag from the corner. And let's try to get this to kind of fit nicely between this rock and this barrel. Okay. Locking the aspect ratio. Yeah, the aspect ratio is locked if you drag from the corner handles. All right, we are making some progress. We have, we have this. We have like our scene set up now. Now we need to create our question. Okay, so this is how you add images. Let's go ahead and start adding um, some shapes. Let's add a shape. So we will go back to the Insert tab and then select this Shape button. And you'll see we get a drop down with all of these different options. And you'll notice when something has a little downward facing arrow like this, like we just clicked on the picture icon earlier, but if we click on the downward facing arrow, we see we get some additional options. And that holds true for all of these. If we click on video, it's gonna try to import a video from our files. But if we do the drop down, we have some additional options. So for shape, no matter where you click, it's going to have you choose which shape you want to add. 
and we'll just select this first rectangle in the rectangle section. Okay, so let's select that. And now we're gonna kind of drag a box up here that's going to include our question. So you can just click and drag after that. Again, so insert, you click on what shape you want, and then you notice my cursor changes a little bit. It's like this plus sign. And if I just click, it's gonna make a 100 by 100 pixel rectangle. But if you click and drag, you can drag that rectangle to, to be whatever size you want. Yeah, I probably could size this down a little bit, but <laughs> we, it's up to you how big you want to make it on, on your end. Okay, so we have this shape. We need to get it looking a little bit better. We want to change the colors here. So first we'll click on the shape and you'll always know what's selected by these handles around the object, right? Another way to look at what's selected is to look at the timeline. And we haven't talked about this before, but if you look at the bottom of the screen, this is our timeline. And there, this is useful for many reasons. One of them is because you can see what you currently have selected. Like right now we, can, we know that the rectangle is selected by these handles, but we also know it's selected because it's highlighted blue in the timeline here. And maybe your timeline is really small. Like if you have a small screen, it might look like this. You can always resize that by putting your mouse right where this gray meets this white. Okay, so you'll notice the cursor changes. You can click and then drag up to make the timeline take up more space on your screen. The alternative is you could actually even undock these things completely. So notice it sits down at the bottom. If I click on this button right here, there's, there's like two windows um, overlapping each other. Watch this. So now the timeline is like released from that position down there and I can drag it around the screen. I can resize it however I want. So if you have like multiple monitors, like maybe you have like an iPad you're using on a monitor, maybe you just put the timeline on that, on that monitor on its own. So just wanna show we do have these options uh, and you can notice you have that option to look at your, your scenes over here for the triggers panel on the right, which we'll get to soon. Um, you have options. But with this selected, you'll notice we have this format tab up here at the top. Okay, so this is, this is where we go to kind of change the colors and the settings for specific objects. So for shape fill, notice if we click on it, it will change the fill of this object to whatever that bar is beneath the paint bucket. So if I just click on this, it's going to make it red for the fill. And for every shape, yeah, those are the two colors we're affecting. The fill color, which is what's on the inside, and the outline color, which is around the edge. It's a very light outline right now, so we can't see it super well. But if we want to set it to a specific color, we can use the drop-down arrow. You're noticing a trend here. The drop-down arrows give us additional options. So with, with all of these um, colors open, we're just going to select white. So we're going to have a white fill so that when we add black text, it's going to have really nice contrast. And then for the shape outline, we'll select this drop down as well, and we will give it a black outline. Okay. And, and notice the outline is like really thin. If we wanted to make that weightier, we could click on the drop down, go down to weight, and we can make this like super, you know, like that super outlined, like eight pixels. Or we could go somewhere in between. It's really up to you. I'll do like three pixels. That should be good. Okay, we all doing well? Yes, very similar to PowerPoint. Hopefully you're seeing that. You can address, adjust the transparency. So say we're like, okay, this is like really taking up a lot of space here. Like we wanna let some of this nice colorful back, background shine through. We can right click on the shape and then go down to format shape. Yeah, and if you have any questions about features, feel free to ask them. I'm trying to, and I'm sorry if this is a little too basic. We'll, we'll be getting more advanced soon. <laughs> Um, so let's select format shape at the bottom of this list when you right click. And then this is where you can adjust the transparency. So you see, as we make it more transparent, we can see more of the background shine through the box here. Maybe we should do like 15%. So there we go. And, and notice you have some additional options for the fill here. You can use gradients or pictures and all, all of that good stuff. Okay, there we go. So another feature I really like using in this format tab um, are the alignment features. Okay, so generally when we're designing, we wanna keep things pretty balanced. We wanna make sure that the negative space on this side is the same as the negative space on this side. So we could drag it and like try to line it up to be perfectly centered. You see, sometimes they will give us that, um, 
guideline that comes up. But let's say it's like over here and I'm like, okay, I want this perfectly centered on my slide. You can use these arrange and align features here. And look at these little icons. These are what I'm talking about specifically. The icon kind of tells you what it's going to do. But if we click on this align center option up in the top center right here, it's going to put this in the center of our slide instantly. So watch, I'm going to click on this and then it automatically centers it. Okay. So there we go. We have our box. It is perfectly centered. Now we need to add some text. There are a few ways to do that. You can go to the insert tab and then select text box, right? But notice when we hover over that, there's this nice shortcut, control plus T. And someone mentioned this in one of like our first storyline workshops and I hadn't used it before, but now I, I can't help but use it. <laughs> um, but if you use the control T shortcut, you can just put your cursor wherever you want that text box to start and then press control T on your keyboard. And then you can start typing whatever you'd like. Okay, so that's the shortcut I like using now. But yeah, if you go to insert and then text box, you click on text box and then you click on wherever you want that text box to start, just like we did with the, with the rectangle. So let's just click right here. And I will start typing. And I think our question is, who is the most feared pirate of all time? I don't know if this is accurate. I just looked up like pirate facts. Maybe subjective if people are like pirate buffs, but I think this will be sufficient for our needs here. Okay, so once we've created that text, and this might this is a little tricky, okay? So when when we're working with text boxes, we have to we have to keep an eye on something. So notice when I'm in the text box right now, this cursor is flashing and the box is dashed, right? So if I look in the home tab, this is where I can change my text settings. So notice I can change my font, I can change the, the text size, I can make text bold, but watch if I try to make the text bold right now. See, I clicked on bold, but it didn't actually make anything bold. If I type, it, it, it makes bold wherever the cursor is. So if I start typing letters, now they're bold. You see? I'm gonna erase those. Um, and this is what I mean about being careful with text boxes. The dashed lines will do, will, will have these things affect the text very different than if the lines are solid. When the lines are solid and you don't see that cursor, it means you've selected the text box as a whole versus selecting specific location within that text box. Maybe a little bit confusing, but the way to access the text box as a whole is to either click on the dashed lines that are outlining it, or, and what I like to do, you can press the escape key on your keyboard. So watch, all I do is press escape, and now I've selected the text box as a whole, so if I try to make this text bold, it makes the entire text box bold. Okay? So something to be careful of when working with text boxes. Like if you want to just make one word bold or unbold, then yeah, of course, just highlight that specific word. But if you want to do something to the whole text box, always press the escape key so that the entire text box is selected. So we will make that bold. And then let's go ahead and go to the format tab and select that align center icon so that this is centered on the screen. Okay, and I see people asking about groups and, and some good stuff. We will get to those. Ooh. We can get to those. I, I wasn't going to get to groups in this because I know it can be a little confusing, but may, maybe we will. Let's take a step back though. Let's address some of these things. So you've been seeing some comments about locking the background. So if we're like trying to act like move one of these things, we don't want to accidentally grab our background and pull it off of the screen. Okay, and the way we do that is in the timeline down here. Notice we have this column with all of the kind of eye icons. If we click on that, it hides that object from the screen. And this will be hidden on our slide view, in our preview, and in the published project. So it can help a lot when you're like developing. Like if you want to hide something to get to something that's like beneath it, you might use this um, eye icon to hide and show things. But then also in the column next to it, notice we have this lock and unlock option. So if we click on the lock icon, it's always unlocked by default, but if we lock it, now, if I try to drag this um, image, I can't because it's locked. So good point about that. Uh, thank you, Eileen. 
so yeah, so that's how that's how we lock things. We can, what we can also do, and what we should do, it's best practice, is to name the the items that we're adding to the screen. Okay, so notice in the timeline, our background is just named picture one, and our chest is just named picture two. So when we get a little bit later and we start trying to use triggers, so that we say like when the user clicks on this, do this. We want to be able to say like when the user clicks on the chest, not when the user clicks on like picture two. <laughs> so to rename items, you just double click on them. So picture one, let's double click on that and let's rename that to background. Picture two, let's double click on where it says picture two and we can rename that to chest. Rectangle one, we can double click on that and rename it to question background. And then text box one, we can double click and rename to question text. Okay, so good tips. Always good practice to keep things named. It's just, you know, like some people, you, you might not do that. I probably didn't do that in my early projects. But then when you dive back into a project or another person takes a look at it, like it's going to be very overwhelming if things are not named appropriately. <laughs> yeah, everybody, naming your items is so critical for triggers, definitely. Okay, I think that's all we wanted to cover. And then the timeline, if you're wondering like why it's called the timeline, it's because it shows you where and when things will appear on the slide. Like notice this this at the top, this is, these, are, these are seconds. So right now everything starts at zero seconds and ends at five seconds. But if you're like, okay, maybe I don't want this text to come in until two seconds, you can put your mouse right at the beginning of this text box and then drag it so that now, obviously, the question text doesn't exist between zero and two seconds on the timeline. So for the first two seconds, nothing at all will, will appear. And then if we wanted like the text to disappear at the four second mark, we can drag it from the right side over here and drag it down. And we, we don't actually want to do this, but we're not going to get to cover a timeline a ton in this, in this uh, workshop. So let's just look at this now and see the effect it has. So no text, at the two second mark, that text appears, and at the four second mark, that text disappears. So just know you can control when things appear. To make it, we don't want that to happen, so we'll just right click on the object on the timeline here, and we can select this show always option. And that will make it appear, it will, it will be here in the beginning and it will be here at the end. So that's just a quick way to like undo what I had just done. There's a question about how to expand the timeline because right now it only goes to five seconds. If we want this to appear at like the 10 second mark, then we can just put our cursor right at the very end of the timeline where you see this thin gray line. We can, you'll notice our cursor changes. Then we can click and drag the end of the timeline as far as we'd like. Okay, people are asking about animations. You can definitely do that. So if we wanted this text to animate in, we can select it. We go to the animations tab and here's where we can add entrance and exit animations. So say we want the text to like uh, flow in over the period of 0.75 seconds, starting at one second, we can do that. And I have workshops where we dive deeper into animations, like way, way deeper. But just to kind of show you, yeah, you can add entrance animations so that things aren't just like abruptly appearing out of nowhere. There we go, we get that nice flow in effect. Okay, let's get back on track. I'm going to remove that animation. I'm going to make sure that my question text is here on the beginning of the timeline. And now we need some buttons. Okay, and a common way that people may want to add buttons is by going to the insert tab and then selecting this button option right here and then choosing one of these pre-made buttons that Storyline provides for us. I do not recommend that you do this because these buttons are going to bring in some some states along with them. And I've found after over thousands of hours in Storyline that the built-in states can be really problematic at times. And I'm not even being sarcastic when I say like, when I help people troubleshoot Storyline files, like at least half of the time, it's a problem with built-in states that we resolve just by building them custom. So if you don't know what I'm referring to by states, don't worry right now. Just the one thing to remember is don't rely on built-in states when you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure some people can relate to that. Thank you, Reba. <laughs> um, 
So how we want to add a button, how, how I always add buttons is by going to the insert tab and then we're just going to add a rectangle like we did for the background. So we'll go to shape and then select the first rectangle. And now we're just going to drag a button sized rectangle. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, yeah, a few people learned that the hard way. Yep, don't rely on the built-in states. <laughs> okay, no, notice something. Before I even start changing the colors of this, notice that it got brought in on the timeline at the four second mark. And that's because where this playhead is positioned, and you can reposition it by just clicking up here in the timeline section, where that's positioned is where new objects will get added to the slide. So because this, I, I left this, you know, by accident at the four second mark, this thing is coming in at four seconds. We obviously don't want that. So I'm gonna bring the playhead all the way back to the beginning and I'm going to drag this rectangle to the beginning as well. Okay, so with this shape selected, let's go back to the format tab. And now since we already uh, made a shape with white fill and a black outline, you know, namely this background, we can just click on the icons without clicking on the dropdown to give it those same settings. Okay, so with the rectangle selected, we click on shape fill and then shape outline. Nice and easy. Um, let's, let's give this one a text. What is, what is, okay, so one of them will be Blackbeard. Okay, so I just typed in Blackbeard, but notice you can't actually see the text. It's because we need to make that text black. And right, if I just, if, if after I get done typing it, I just try to make the text black like I just did, it doesn't actually change that text. It only changes the text after the cursor. So really important to remember, we have to press the escape key to select this rectangle as a whole, just like we do when we're working with um, text boxes. So now with the whole rectangle selected, we will make the text black by going to the home tab and selecting this font color option and making it black. All right, so there we go. I could probably make our button a little bit bigger so it has some more uh, space in there, but it's nice because automatically when you add text to these shapes, it's centered vertically. So it has equal space above the text and below the text as well as on the left and right. So nice, easy way to make a button. Um, obviously this doesn't look amazing. Like I really would have loved to have like a nice pirate themed font that we use, um, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. So this will, this will be sufficient. I realize we have a decent amount of ground to cover. So rectangle one, let's rename this to black beard button in the timeline. What we can also do is we want it so that when someone hovers over this button, maybe we want the colors to invert. So when someone hovers over this, maybe we want it to have a black fill and white text. And that's how we start making things interactive. Okay. So we're about to dive into that. So you know, rename it if you're going to, if not, here's where we're gonna start taking this up a level. So the, the main difference between Storyline and PowerPoint is we can add interactivity on the slide in Storyline. And yeah, maybe there are some ways to kind of do that in PowerPoint, but this is what Storyline is built for, okay? So first, let's create a state, okay? And, and you can get to the states panel by going to this tab right next to the timeline. So we're still at the bottom of our screen. It's in the same area, but we're going to, going to select states instead of timeline. Okay, so states. States are kind of like what they sound like. M multiple states of a single object can exist at once, right? So it's like Schrodinger's cat. It's like there is a cat or the cat's alive. You know, the state is in this normal state or we can make this object hidden, this hidden state. And then when someone's previewing this, they wouldn't see that. <laughs> so these are the two like default states for any object you have. It's, it's normal or hidden. So it either is here or it's not here, okay? But we can actually edit these states and add additional ones that can have any features they want. So that's what we're going to do here. We want to create a hover state so that when someone hovers over this, uh, the colors change. So let's select this edit states option. Notice the, you know, the, the background here is like blurred out. We're focusing only on this object. And we can select this new state button to create a new state. We have a question about built-in states. We're about to take a look at that. So let's, let's just select this page icon to select to create a new state. 
And before we do anything, click on this drop down right here. So click on this blue button. This is where you see these built in states. Okay, there is a built in hover state. And for this simple purpose, it would work for us. So all we need to do is, yeah, use this built in hover state, change the colors, and then storyline behind the scenes will make it so that whenever someone hovers over it, it changes to whatever colors we give it in that state. Oh, like I said, avoid these whenever you possibly can. And with buttons, you can't avoid them. Like I'm not being sarcastic. I've seen someone build a project, like super, super complex project with hundreds of slides. And they use these built in hover states. And then at a certain point, whenever someone would hover over one thing on the slide, every single hover state on the slide would activate. And, and they were like, how do we fix it? I'm like, I'm sorry, but you need to use the, the custom states. We can't rely on the built in ones. And that fixed it. But imagine how many hours that person spent going back in. And he had like 10 triggers associated with like, it, it was just a huge mess. And I'm like, it might be easy now to use the built in states, but there will be a time when you really, really regret it. <laughs> and I wouldn't really expect it to change anytime soon. This has been a problem for years and it's still not resolved. So for now, we're going to do custom. And a part of making custom states is you cannot use any of the names of the built in states. So when we want to create this hover state, we have to be a little creative with it and we have to name it hover state. Whoops. So I just use this like camel case, like first letter, lowercase, and then the, or the first word is lowercase. And then the first letter of each additional word is capitalized. I used to just call it like hover with an extra R at the end, but that looks more like a typo than this. <laughs> so we will name this hover state and then we will select add. And now we'll see down here in the states panel, we have these two states. We have the normal state and the hover state. The changes we make to one of these will not affect the changes we make to the other in this view. So check it out. So let's make sure hover state is selected and then let's give it the coloring that we want it to have. So we'll go to the format tab and then change the shape fill to black. And then we will go back to the home tab and change the text color to white. Hover, wow, Melissa, that is very true. The hover with additional Rs would be very fit for this, uh, this project. The thing about that though, is that the, the end user, the person going through the final version of this will never see the name of the states, but very punny. <laughs> okay, so can I repeat that? Yeah, all we did was we selected the hover state and then we're changing the shape fill to black and the text color to white. So now notice the normal state, if we click on the normal one, it still looks exactly as we had it. But when we click on the hover state, the coloring is different. And just to show you what's possible with this, this doesn't just come down to like changing colors. You can literally like add entire pictures into states. Like watch, if I want to like add a, a chest into this, like I, 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 we would never want to do this like this. But look, I, now there's, a, there's an entire chest next to this button. <laughs> so you can, yeah, you can do a lot more than just change those at those, uh, those colors, but this is all we need it for right now. So there we go. Once we have this one like this, let's select done editing states. And, and now we need to actually use a trigger. Okay. So this is what I was getting to. This is where storyline gets really interesting where you can do some really cool things. So let's look over here in the triggers panel now, because we have this hover state, but we need a trigger so that when the user actually hovers over this, it changes the state. Let's look over here. Notice by default, we have these player triggers. Even though we like hid the player, these, these triggers will still persist. So there isn't a next button because that's something associated with the player. And we don't want the user to be able to, to just swipe the screen to go to the next slide on mobile. So let's select one of these, these triggers and then select this trash can icon right here to delete it. And we'll dive into triggers in a second, but let's just get rid of both of these. So click on them and then press the trash can. Okay, so to create a new trigger, what we're going to do is we're going to select this page icon and you're probably seeing a, a common theme here, right? So these, these page icons mean like create new of whatever, whatever panel we're in. So let's select that and you're about to experience the, the wonderful world of interactivity in Storyline. So when you click on that, it opens up the trigger wizard and there are a few different parts to triggers. Okay, there is the action, the when, and the conditions. So let's look at the actions first. 
So if you click on one of these um, like hyperlinks, basically is what they are, you'll be able to see all of the different the different actions. So the actions are the things that we can do based on user input. So let's look at some of these. So obviously we see right away the first one, change state of. So that is what we're going to need for this specific slide. We want to change the state of that button to the hover state when the user takes a certain action. But just take a look here at, at some of the other things we could do. We could show and hide layers, which we haven't gotten to yet. Hopefully we'll have time to get to them here. We can jump to specific slides in the course. We can jump to different parts on the timeline. So say we wanna just jump directly to the four second mark when someone clicks on something, we could do that. Uh, light boxes, we won't get into here. Um, we can play media. So we can like play a sound effect whenever someone clicks on something or hovers over something. Uh, we can restart the entire project. We could exit the project. We can pause and resume the timeline. We can open specific URLs. So we can make it so when someone clicks on a button, it like opens a link in another tab. We could execute JavaScript. So if we have any developers here, um, you know, you can you can extend storyline in some pretty cool ways. So there we go. That's just a quick overview. Like there take some time to go through all of these just to know what is possible based on user input. But we're just going to select change state of. And this is where naming your objects really becomes helpful. So now we need to pick which object we want to change the state of. So let's select that one. And we know pretty easily we want to change the state of this Blackbeard button. Okay, so let's click on Blackbeard button. And now we need to choose which state we want to change it to. So we want to change it to the hover state. And then all of the ones we added will be organized right here at the top under custom. Okay, so we'll, we'll change this to that hover state, and, and now we get into the when. So our action is good. We know we want to change it to hover, but when do we want to do that? Let's click on where it says timeline starts and look at all of these options. So we can do it when the user clicks on something, when they double click on something, when they right click on something. Notice there are a lot of options here. When they hover over something, um, we're not going to go through all of these. But like I said, on your own time, explore all of these so that, you, and, and some of them might not make sense immediately, but it is just good to know like what's possible in the tool. So we want to do when the mouse hovers over. Okay. So when the mouse hovers over this, by default, it's the background again. So this means whenever the mouse is over the background, then that button will be in a different state. We don't want that. We want to change this object to Blackbeard button. And there we go. This is all we need right now. We're not going to get into conditions in this workshop, but this unlocks a lot of additional flexibility. So change the state of the button to the hover state when the user hovers over it. And notice this option down here at the bottom, restore previous state when the user hovers out. This is checked by default so that when we move our mouse back off of it, it goes back to this, this normal state. If we had this unchecked, then when you hover over it, it would change to the black background. But when we hover off, it would never change back. And that is not what we want. So let's click on OK now. And congrats if you followed along with that. Maybe it was fairly simple, but there we go. That's the, the first step to adding interactivity in Storyline. Once you get comfortable with triggers, you'll be able to do some really cool stuff here. So let's see. Randy, now that you've defined the, defined the hover state for this buzz button, does it become a global option for the rest of the project? No, it does not. Uh, Chris, you grouped Blackbeard and the rectangle together and you cannot manipulate the grouping in states. Um, we want to get to groups so we can get, we can get to groups. So let's just create this second button really quickly. So I like to use this method called like the, well, I don't know if it's like called this, but it's like easy to remember, like the copy, paste and replace method. So I like to build out my interactions and all of my interactive features one thing at a time and get them perfect. And then I just duplicate them and swap things out. So if we wanted to make that second button, we could go back up to the insert tab and create a shape and then just so on and so forth, redo all of this. We obviously don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click this. I'll click on the border and start dragging it. I'm going to hold down the shift key on my keyboard so that the so that it's aligned. And then I'm going to hold down the control key on my keyboard. And what that does is when you let go, as long as you're holding the control key, it will make a copy of your object. Okay, 
So like if I wanted to make a copy of this, I just drag it wherever, I hold down control right before I let go of my mouse, and then it makes a copy. I obviously don't want that, but that is how we replace things. And no, I've, I have never had any issues with the copy, paste, and replace process, but it would be an issue if like you're, you're copying and pasting something that isn't functional. Then obviously, it's, if, you, if you carry that problem through, it's not just going to be a problem in one place, it's going to be a problem, problem everywhere. So there we go. Now, instead of recreating this from scratch, we just change the text. We're going to change this to, I think I said like gold arm. I just like made up something random. I don't know. Think of a pirate sounding name and make it that. And then we'll double click on it down here in the timeline. We don't want this to be named Blackbeard button one, which is what it will get by default if you make a copy. We'll rename this to gold arm button. And since when we copied this, it carried the trigger along with it. So now it will, it will function just like we need it to when we hover and it carries this state along with it. And notice when we change the text in uh, the normal state from this view without going into edit states, it does also change in the hover state. So that's a nice time saver as well. Um, Leila, Leila, I was holding down shift so that it was like constrained. Like if I don't hold down shift, see like if my cursor is down here and I'm not holding down shift, it's not aligned with the top. But when I hold down the shift key, it automatically pumps it back up there so that it's, it's aligned. You see like that? So it's just an alignment feature. And then I just pressed escape to get out of that. Okay, we do not have a ton of time, but we are going, I'm gonna move a little bit more quickly. Um, our slide, notice right here, it's 1.1 untitled slide over here in the sidebar. We can double click on, on that slide name, just like we do objects down here to rename it. So let's double click on this and let's rename this to question. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna create that try again screen, that screen now. So I'm going to right click on this slide and duplicate it. You can create a new slide by going to the home tab and like selecting new slide or control shift M, but that will just give you a blank slide. We wanna use that copy paste and replace method. So we're going to right click and select duplicate. Now we have slide 1.2, also titled question. We're going to title this one, try again. Try again. Um, I'm just gonna double click into the text here. I'm gonna keep clicking until all of the text is selected. And I want this to say, are not quite. Nobody knows gold arm. So just, you know, some kind of try again text. We'll make sure that this is centered. So I'll press escape to get the whole text box selected. And then I will align it to the center. And see, I'm moving a bit more quickly now, but it's using principles we've already covered. So hopefully this isn't too, too much. Now we have two buttons here. We only need one. So I'm going to click into this one, press the escape key to select the button as a whole, and then press the delete key to get rid of it. I'm going to double click on or triple click on Blackbeard and just make this say try again. And same thing with this, I'll press escape to select the button, go to the format tab and align it to the center of the screen. You can probably do better with like the sizing and stuff here. If you've been to my workshops, you know, adding drives me crazy if it's not right. <laughs> um, but we have this try again button. So now we need to use another trigger. So maybe you can, yeah, you can try to imagine what, what do we want what do we want to happen when the user clicks on this button? So if you're watching the replay, maybe pause this and try to figure this one out, but we're gonna create a new trigger and make it so that it jumps to a slide, not next slide, but the question slide, and not when the user hovers over this button, but when the user clicks on this button. And it's still called Blackbeard button. When we rename this in the timeline, it will be renamed over here. But this is the trigger, jump to that 1.1 question slide when the user clicks this, this button. I'm going to rename this to try again button. Okay. So there we have it. Um, I see we only have five minutes left. We may run a little bit over. I do want to get into, into um, triggers, but we'll, we'll do a little, we'll do a little close out at the top of the hour and then maybe I'll hang out a little bit longer if people want to see us finish this out. Okay. I know some of us will have to go. So there we go. So now going back to 1.1 question slide, we need to make it so that when someone clicks on this gold arm button, it jumps to that 1.2 slide. So we'll create, we'll 
here's a here's a shortcut too instead of like having nothing selected when you make the trigger if you select an object before selecting create a new trigger it's going to fill in some things for you so let's select this gold arm button and then select create a new trigger and with that selected you see the when is already filled in so the gold arm button is already filled in here for the object we don't need to like find it or change it so jump to slide all we need to change here is the slide we're jumping to we're jumping to try again so there we have it we'll press ok here let's preview this scene and now we see when we hover over these it, it changes the state but when we click on gold arm we see our not quite nobody knows gold arm try again and we can do that all day long, jumping back and forth between these two slides. All right, so, and notice, I, I mean, I didn't explicitly call this out, but notice we can have as many triggers as we want associated with one button. And we can even have it so that when someone hovers over this, we could have like 10 different things change their states. So you can add multiple triggers to a single object, of course. Now let's just build out the success slide. So I'm going to duplicate the try again slide here. I'm going to right click on it and select duplicate. And instead of try again, we're going to name this um, success. All right, let's change the text here. So this is going to be nice. Uh, now unlock your treasure with the key. Okay, I will center that. We don't need a button here. So I'm going to delete this button. But what we do want is the key image. So I'm going to go to the insert tab up here and then select picture and then select this key.png uh, image file. And then I'll just drag it up here into this box. Kristen's asking about jumping to a new slide versus jumping to a layer. We're, we're just about to dive into layers. Okay. And I know, I know some of you do want to hop out. I just do want to announce a couple of things before we keep going. So the first one is, let's see here. So if you do want to dive deeper into Storyline, I have like the, there are a library of these Storyline workshops growing on my YouTube channel. So like I said, most of them, they start out fairly basic. We will cover some things we've covered here just more quickly, but they can, and some of them get like super, super advanced. <laughs> And some of them are, are more beginner friendly, like I think this um, uh, scenario based e learning one is fairly beginner friendly. But yeah, so check out this playlist if you're looking for free content. But I am also excited because over the last few months, I have been working on this storyline project lab. So this is a paid program, but we go through eight projects together. And yeah, I mean, check out this landing page. Uh, we'll share the link in the chat. But if you do want like a more formal program that isn't live and that it is self-paced and like designed to go like lesson by lesson, like more bite size, check this out. You can see some demos of the project here. And we've had a, around 50 or so people go through this as we were building it out. And we have some really nice testimonials already, already online here. So no background knowledge required to dive into that. And it will bring you up to a very advanced level where you're using like variables and conditions and building some really, really complex projects. Cool. So goodbye, everyone who needs to hop out. But we are going to finish this out here. It shouldn't take too much longer. I think we'll be able to wrap this up in the next 10 or 15 minutes. And we will dive into layers and drag and drop trigger. So it should be pretty quickly. But yeah, if you, if you do want to dive into Storyline, please check out that Project Lab program because uh, I think you will be very pleased with it if you, if you have a professional development budget and you want to dive a bit deeper with me here. Cool. Okay, let's dive into this. So layers, right? When we, when we create a new slide, it will always have the, just the base layer, right? It's this, this thing we're adding all of the images to. And you can see the layers down here in the bottom right. It, it says slide layers. And we can see we, we just have this success layer here to start. It's the name of the slide by default. But what we can do is we can create a new layer. And a layer is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that gets layered on top of the bottom of the slide. So it's kind of like, you know, you're just putting on additional layers. If you've used, um, if you've used like the Adobe products, like Adobe Illustrator or Adobe Photoshop, it's the same exact concept. So let, let's select this page icon down here in the slide layers box to create a new layer. And let's name this one um, 
opened chest. Okay. We have this opened, or we'll, let's just name it like congrats or something. So here's where it's going to get fun. On this congrats layer now, we can add something that's going to like cover up everything beneath it. And what we, what we want to add is the graffiti. So you downloaded it earlier. But with this congrats layer open, let's go to the insert tab and then go to um, picture. And then let's double click on this graffiti.png image right here. And there we go, right? We have this nice like graffiti effect just to like drive the point home further that yes, you open this chest. Uh, Steph, ask me that question in a little bit. We'll, I'll take some questions at the end too, right? So now I don't feel so pressured. We have to end it an hour. Once we get this built, I'll take some questions like, and I think that would be really good. Like what do I have a preference between layers versus duplicate slides? So we'll turn this into a little Q and A at the end if you, if you have the time. Okay, so we have this layer. Um, we need to show that layer, right? So let's, let's create a trigger to do that. So we'll select this, create a new trigger button. And we know that our action will be to show layer, congrats, but when are we going to show that layer? The, the short answer, Delaram, is you can, you can do this with a new slide, but layers are good because you can reuse elements that are already on your current slide. So for example, if we just want to have this like glitter appear over everything else we already have, it's kind of overkill to create a whole new slide. And it might be easy, like in the beginning, if you just want to create new slides for everything, you can, you can go ahead and do that. The only downside is it, it might bloat your course a little bit and it might cause like some loading times in between slides. So on layers, every single layer is loaded when that slide is loaded. So there's not going to be any lag or latency when you're moving between layers whereas there may be some when you're moving between slides okay so here we go show layer congrats and now this one isn't going to be super simple like when the user clicks on something it's going to be all the way down here at the bottom we're looking at these drag drop events so we want to open it when the user drops the key on the chest okay and, and drag and drop functionality is not um the most user friendly thing it's, it's, well, it's not not user friendly. It's not accessible. That's the problem. So when you can avoid drag and drops, it's generally a good idea to do so, but clients still ask for them. They're still like somewhat popular, but we're just showing off this feature. It doesn't mean you should like try to fit this into all of your courses, <laughs> but let's look at this. So when the object dropped on, and now notice we have an object and a target. So the object is the thing that you'll be dragging and the target is the place where you should dra drag it to or drop it on. So we'll choose object and we will select picture one, which we should have renamed as key. And then we will select this target drop down and select chest. And notice you can select multiple targets. So we could do like, okay, we'll show that if they drop the key on like any of these objects, that doesn't make sense in this case though. We wanna do it when they drop the key on the chest. And that's all we need to do. But this is going to, to cause some problems for us. Okay, and, and maybe you can already imagine what they'll be, but we're about to troubleshoot them together. So show layer congrats when the user drops the key on the chest. Let me rename that picture one to key. So let's preview this and we're gonna do some group problem solving to think about how to solve this. So when I drag this key onto the chest, I'm about to let go. It shows us our layer and all of that graffiti appears, but clearly this is not looking how we want it to, right? First of all, we need the chest to open. And second of all, we don't want this text box or this rectangle or this key to appear anymore. So first question for you is how can we make the chest uh, appear open when we do this? How can we make the chest open up? layer um state change yes state change will be good we could add the open chest to this layer but then we'll still see the closed chest behind it and and you could do that like you could make this work you could hide the closed chest and then we'll see the open one on here but let's just do it with states here since this is a good use of states so let's select the chest here then we'll go to the states tab we will select edit states let's create a new state and let's name this one opened. Okay. 
now we have this open state and since the the image i gave you is like the same exact dimensions as this and both of the uh, chests are centered within the artboard you can see the space around this we can actually just replace the image and it will be in the perfect position so let's right click on the chest and then we can actually use this replace picture option right here so instead of having to like add a new picture and line it up in the exact right spot, we can just replace the picture we already have on the slide. And I use this a lot for this copy paste and replace method that you know I love so much. <laughs> so replace picture, picture from file. And now we can just double click on open chest. Okay, so there we go. So now if we click back and forth between these two, we see that we have one open and one closed. Randy saying this can get complicated really fast. Randy, yeah. There will be slides that you develop that have like hundreds of triggers on them in some cases if you get into complex work. So the naming is super important, like your development patterns that you're using, you wanna be really consistent with. And if it seems overwhelming now, it can become second nature quite quickly as you, as you get some practice. But there we go, okay. And, I'm not, and this isn't exactly the most optimized way to do this, but I was just racking my brain, I'm like how can I show off states and layers and like as little time possible. And I still wanted to like have this fun little drag and drop interaction. So <laughs> um, yeah, this may not be the most optimized way. It would be easier if we just jumped to a new slide that had what we wanted, but we're gonna do this to just like illustrate these uh, techniques. And thanks to everyone who stayed so far. I mean, we still have a pretty, we still have a couple hundred people here, but if you do need to hop out, no worries. I know this is the middle of the workday. Okay, so we have that second state. Now we need to change that state. Right, so we can just actually duplicate this trigger. So we already have something happening when the user drops the key on the chest. So instead of only showing the layer, what we can do is we can press this copy the selected trigger button icon. And then right next to it, we can select this paste the copied trigger icon. And now notice we have two of these. So both of them say show layer congrats. I could double click on this to open up the uh, trigger wizard for that trigger or I can just highlight over the things I want to change. So notice when I, when I put my mouse over show layer, I can click on that and now I can see all of the different actions. And I want to change the state of, not key. So now I can just click on where it says key and then select chest. And then I don't want to change it to the normal state. I want to change it to the opened state. Okay, I'll double click on this so you can see what we're working with here. So that's just like uh, a quicker way to edit triggers. You see, so instead of having to open the trigger wizard, you can just click on those things directly there in the trigger panel. So we're, we're getting closer. So now when we preview this, when we drop that key on the chest, the chest will open and we'll see the graffiti. There we go, the chest opens perfectly. We see all of this graffiti. What can we do to get rid of the key, the rectangle and the text box? Andrew just made something really strange with this info about his own assets. Andrew, we would love to see that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> okay, we have variables. No, we're not getting into variables here. Uh, triggers, yes, triggers, but what kind of triggers, Rhonda? Layer, we don't need any new layers. Like layers, again, most of the time we're using layers to show things on top of what we already have, not necessarily to hide things that are on the base layer. Go back to your layer right now. Okay, look, look at layer settings. When you click on any layer or any slide, you can click on this gear down here in the bottom right and there are visibility options. So by default, when you create a layer, it will hide other slide layers, but it will not hide objects on the base layer. And if we hide objects on the base layer, we're going to lose our background. So we don't want to do that. Unless, yeah, we don't want to do that. And we would lose our chest too. Change the timeline for each image. Not quite, because we don't know how long it will take someone to actually complete this. Change state to hidden. Hannah got it, Hannah got it. So it was a little detail we, we had earlier. No animations, we need to change the state. Remember, every one, everything we add by default has that normal state, but there's also a hidden state, which makes it disappear. So that is the trigger we need to use. So I'm going to just copy, I'm just gonna paste in that trigger that we already copied that show layer congrats, and we're gonna change it. We're gonna change the state of the key, but not to normal, we're gonna change it to hidden. That is like the one 
built-in state that I would say is safe to use. So change state of the key to hidden when the user drops the object on the target. Okay, so let's preview this. C said, click on the triangle next to the base, next to baseline in the timeline and hide the items that way. Oh yeah, that's actually pretty smart. So you're saying go on here. Oh, okay, okay. This, see, are you a beginner? <laughs> so this is another way that's smart to do it. We can hide the visibility of objects on the base layer from this layer. Very smart, very smart. So this is this is easier, right? So we don't we don't necessarily need to hide things from the base layer here. We can go onto this first layer and then hide the specific items from the base layer that we don't want to appear here. Very smart technique. I did not think of that, uh, but we can do that, right? So let's get rid of the text. Let's get rid of the box, and then the key we already have being hidden with the trigger I just added. So really, really good observation there. This is the power of the audience. Thank you. Okay, so we were using a mixture of techniques just to highlight them all. If anyone is confused about this, just let us know. Um, this is almost done. This slide should work perfectly, but we need to make sure that when someone clicks on Blackbeard, we're jumping to that slide. So I'm going back to the question slide. I'm clicking on Blackbeard, and we're going to jump to slide success when the user clicks on the Blackbeard button. Then we'll press OK. And now we can preview this entire project. So to do that, we're just going to click on preview and then select entire project from the beginning. Hannah, the replay will be on YouTube tomorrow at probably 9.30 Pacific time. Here we go. Who is the most feared pirate of all time? We will say gold arm. Not quite. We'll try again. Now we will select Blackbeard. It jumps to that slide. We need to unlock our treasure. We'll do that. And there we go, success. Okay, thank you my friends for hanging out with me this long. I think it's time to open the floor to a Q&A. If anyone got stuck, let us know. But how are we all doing with that? I don't know how many of us were really brand, brand new. I know some of us had some experience and I commend you for sticking out with us till the end, but let's do a Q&A for a little bit. Any questions about what's possible about states versus layers versus slides? Let me know. Nice, Andrew, using it for the first time. Andrew, we've got to see your creation. Can you publish it to Articulate Review for us? <laughs> okay, Taylor marked some questions. Let's see. Would there ever be a good reason to use both layers and slides, or does that create complications, something we should avoid doing? Yeah, you can use both. But like, imagine you have a question with three different options. Okay, three different buttons. You wouldn't want to do like, okay, the first button, the first answer choice brings you to like a layer, and then the second two answer choices bring you to different slides. All right, like that would be kind of confusing. Like if our, like we want to be consistent with it, I guess is what I'm saying. What, what I often do, how I combine states as layers is I'll have these like scenario-based learning experiences, and each question will bring you to a different slide. So then when you're looking at it in story view, here, let's look at this. So when you're looking at it in story view, you can kind of see, okay, here is how all of my branching is going on. And you can imagine as this is built out, you can see how different objects are, are branched. But then uh, on those slides, I'll have like a help feature where you can kind of like talk to a mentor character or view a job aid, and we keep that stored on a layer. So when you click like the, oh, get help button, it brings a layer up onto the screen so that you can get some specific help for that question. So I hope that makes sense. You will get a feel for it as you go. You'll develop techniques that, that you like. Some people might do the question and all of the feedback on a single slide, just using layers. Um, but generally, I, like, I use layers when I, when I want to reuse things on the base layer. But we could do a whole workshop on, on that. Is there a visually appealing alternative for drag and drop? Um, the alternative to drag and drop I've seen and used is like kind of like matching. So you'll have like a list of items on the left and then you'll have like, you know, scrambled like definitions or something on the right. And you kind of put in like, okay, this one goes with item B and this one goes with like item C. You can, you've probably done worksheets like that on paper where you kind of like match things. So that's what I've done, but it wouldn't be something like this where we're kind of like dragging 
um, a key to a chest. You could do like select the key and then select the chest. So like when we click on the key, it could like glow and then we click on the chest and it like unlocks. Maybe we could do something like that. Um, all right, let's look back at the chat. I think we talked a bit about the layers. Let's see. Can 360 projects be exported to another LMS like Moodle? Absolutely. That's why everyone uses Storyline. Um, it's because it publishes SCORM packages and that's what's like so popular in our field right now, right? You can just upload the SCORM packages to the LMS. We won't get into if that's a good idea, but yeah, that is basically what Storyline is designed for. It's to create these SCORM packages so you can track and enroll people on a learning management system. And pretty much any learning management system that you use can support um, one of the outputs that Storyline is able to produce. Uh, Susan asked if there's a reason why I don't write into the shape instead of adding it, why I do write into the shape instead of adding a text box on top of the shape. So Susan, so this gets into groups, which we didn't really cover, but maybe we should look at that really quickly, okay? Just so you can see what a group is. So check this out. So we have all three of these elements here, right? And we can, we can say, okay, instead of having these all be separate things, we can group these together. So I can click on this, hold down the shift key, and then select additional objects. So you hold down the shift key to select multiple objects. And then if I press the control G key on my keyboard, G for group, it will make it be treated as basically one object on the timeline. You see now it just says group one, and the only other things we see are the chest in the background. Susan, I think you're asking, why don't we just do, we do a rectangle and then add a separate text box on top of that? One of the reasons is because then if you wanna animate that in, um, or add triggers to it, you would have to add triggers to the group. Like if you're going to group the text and the button. And adding triggers to groups is another one of th those things that's possible, but it's going to cause problems for your project. At some point, it's going, to, it's going to get you. So that's another thing I recommend not doing. Do not add triggers to groups because it's not very reliable and there will be times when that breaks. Um, the other reason is like if you have multiple objects, then you can be like, okay, yeah, when the user clicks the rectangle, but if like you click exactly on the text, I may be wrong on this, but I think if you click on like exactly on the text and the trigger is added to the rectangle behind it, then you, it won't actually fire that trigger because the text is like blocking the rectangle. That makes sense. So yeah, I, I've, I've used all those approaches. Like I've used, I, I did not use this approach for like a year. I would use groups and stuff, but once you get burned by it once or multiple times you you find ways to avoid using that approach and learn from my learning the hard way <laughs> just i would suggest using a rectangle and then just have the text be directly in that shape which video of your youtube series should we watch first if we're just beginning i think how to develop scenario-based e-learning would be a good one in that uh, workshop series should you use layers for motion graphics what is the maximum number of layers before you start having problems I don't know about that, Brandon. I, I don't know if there is a maximum number of layers. I've worked on projects that have had like between 20 and 30. Um, and I imagine you'll have problems with latency maybe as you add more intense media. But how Storyline works, there's an article about this somewhere on, on the site. Is like whenever you get to a slide, it will like preload the next three slides for you. So I think like if you're trying to get to a slide and then like this fourth slide has like a ton of content on it, there's still like some buffering or latency and you'll see like the dots that it's like loading. But that will just be like if you have like huge files. I think if you have a hundred layers and all it is is like a text box on each layer, I think that will load faster than if you have a, a slide with no layers, just the base layer and like a big video on it. A good place to start for images. Good question, Christina. Uh, freepick.com, F-R-E-E-P-I-K.com is a good one. And I also have a video on my YouTube channel about where to get graphics for e-learning projects. And I go through like 10 different options in there. Okay, I, th I think we're getting through all the questions. Let's see, I'm gonna need to find my way back to the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, so can you use all the features on the trial version? Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, at least the trigger wizard, um, the, the, the thing about the states, I just wouldn't trust the built-in states, like the hover, the selected, like those ones. I would just create a new custom state. 
Can we use a trial version for your new Storyline Lab? Absolutely, Danielle. It's a 60-day free trial. Yeah, all everything you'll need to do in the lab, you can do with the trial version and anything you publish, the portfolio projects you create um, through the project lab, as long as you publish them before your trial is complete, you can post them on your portfolio, share them with employers, and it will look just like you made it with the full licensed version of Storyline. And you can request extensions too if the 60 days is not enough. So thank you everyone for hanging out here with me. If you do want to dive deeper into this and, and like a lot, lot deeper into this, then check out the project lab. Like I said, it, it just went live today. I've been working on it for the last two and a half months. Um, but if it isn't in your budget or you wanna soak up what you can with the free content, um, that has been taking up a lot of my time the last two and a half months. So I'm hoping December and January, we're gonna be getting a ton back into the YouTube content. Hopefully I can get back to a weekly live events, but that won't be until early next year, probably. Got a lot of housework going on. It's It's been hectic over here, but there's a lot of more free content coming and I hope to see some of you in the project lab. So we will talk soon. Thanks for hanging out here with me and good luck everyone with Storyline. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.